Everyone at DocSoc has been asking me for like the last three days, hey, tell us what you're going to ask us up on stage so we can prepare some answers. And I've you know, very uh, straightforwardly said, none of the other speakers that come to our events ever get any questions from us ahead of time. So I don't think it'd be fair if you do either. So none of them know what I'm going to ask. Truth be told, I'm not really sure exactly what I'm going to ask. Exactly. That's exactly right. What we're going to do is we're going to do these panels in 20-minute sessions. And then we're going to open each panel up for five-minute Q&A. And then we're going to switch to the next panel. So it's going to be a bit of a speed round. So what I want you guys to do really quickly is give like a very short, quick background on you, like your experience and product, what you do. And then we're going to jump into the questions. All right. You start, Amigo. Uh, can you hear me? OK. So my name is Alon Schwartz. Apparently, uh, I'm the co-founder and CTO of DocStock and Jason's partner. Uh, apparently, I'm not technical enough as a CTO to cut the technical uh, team uh, discussion, so I'm a part of the product, right? Thank you, Jason. That's a great uh, show of confidence in the CTO capabilities. Um, so that's pretty much me. I'm a technical guy. Uh, what, were you doing? what were you doing before this? Before, part of a different startup, um, about six and a half years, enterprise software, decided that's enough for me. So that the web is a lot more interesting. Um, started thinking about my own startup. At some point, I met this dude here. And uh, the rest is history. Cool. Hey, my name is Alan Jones. Uh, I started off at a company called Helio, which was a really successful venture. I'm not sure how, of how many of you guys know about that. Um, after I went to a company called MyLife.com, which was previously Reunion.com, it's a major subscription powerhouse. And uh, I am now at DocStock. I mostly specialize in product, but I, uh, my sub-specialties is style, music, and uh, funniness, which my team probably doesn't agree with me at all, but that's right. Hi, my name is Zach Richards. Um, I started off as a, at an agency for two years, doing everything from print, web. I wanted to focus on a, a web more, and uh, I moved out to LA. From originally from Ohio, and I was working at Yahoo on the news team out there over there here in Santa Monica, and got a job offer from DocSoc. So now I'm the lead designer there, and learning a lot. <laughs> so definitely. So. Hi, I'm uh, Dudi Aini. Um, I started, I came from Israel. I started as a developer and then project manager for, uh, for IT security, secret, top secret uh, systems for the government and banks and things like that. I came to LA about four and a half years ago, um, went to school here, and then I met Jason, and I was, part, I was lucky enough to be part of the very um, beginning of this company. I'm the VP of e-commerce and, and content, and what that, that means is that anything that relates to the product that's actually documents and, and the content on the website, not just the features and the nice things that they build, um, that's me. Cool. All right, so uh, let me set the ground rules both for us and for everyone here. The panel tonight uh, that we're here talking about is how to build um, a great internet company. I want to be very clear, this is not a sales pitch trying to say like, hey, we're the best internet company, we're going to tell you how it's done. What we are is probably a couple steps ahead of where a lot of you are. And the fact of the matter is each of us were right where, where you're sitting now, and now we've got a company of about 30 of us. You know, we reach about 25 million people a month. It's probably one of the bigger websites um, online, one of the better well-known ones. And there are a lot of things I think we do well, and a lot of things we're still try striving to do well. So our goal tonight is to be as open and candid and honest about the things that we do well, the things that we don't do well, and what we think overall from our experience is made from a great internet company, both from our DocSoc experience and other experience. So with that said, with the first question I have for, for you all is, what are the things when it comes to product, coming up with the ideas, designing, implementing, that you think that we do really well as a company, that other folks have a chance to learn from and emulate and the lessons they want to take, and what are the things that you think that we still have to improve and where we've had challenges and where we want to strive to get better? So I'll let Alan speak, but I'll just say we'll, we think we're better than everyone else. No, no, I'm joking. Um, why don't you do So um, some of the things I think we do really well at DocStock is we, you know, and you hear this a lot in the industry, it's like test, test, test. No, seriously, test, right? Like we, we spend a lot of our time testing the waters, trying to figure out, figure out what it is our users actually want, and then we go out and build the actual product. Um, I'll add on to that, you know, we iterate really, really quickly um, so that we're moving faster than, I mean, probably a lot of people in the industry just in, not just in the speed that we work at, but just in, you know, how we all interact with each other and, and it's really, really seamless. So uh, to sum it up, you know, we iterate quickly um, and we have seamless communication within the team that I, I think we do that really, really well. Let me what, what are the things that you think that um, 
we need to get better at that other companies do really well from a product ideation and execution standpoint? You know, some, sometimes we need to be more focused, right? Which happens a lot. I mean, it's, it's not abnormal to get caught up in the day-to-day -day and, and, and just work as fast as you possibly can. But every once in a while, and it's something that we need to do better at DocSuck, is we need to really just pull back and you know, ask ourselves, you know, what, what are we building right now? Who is this for? Who is the user? And just be really, really laser focused. I think that's something we can definitely improve on. So just to add to the previous point, I mean, the other thing we're doing that's, um, I mean, we're really crazy, I guess. Um, we like to do things that are just like, completely out. So for example, when we started thinking about starting uh, the subscription model that we started uh, late October, we just, okay, well, let's put a page there that let people think that they're gonna pay for this document. And of course, when millions of people are coming every day, that's kind of a very risky thing. And what will people think? And what will the, if it will leak out to TechCrunch and people will know and it will break the company, it's a major shift. And we just did it anyways. And we just tried out and see what happens. And, and, we, and we weren't even charging. We just oh, right, right, right. didn't it charge anyone. It's just like an HTML page. There's nothing, static page, right? There's no, we're just recording the intent of people to pay. We didn't build anything. And just one day we build a page and throw it out there. So the lesson really is, if you have an idea, just don't be afraid of trying it out. I mean. The, there won't be that big of a lashback. Just, just try, be as crazy as you can, and if it doesn't work, pull the plug, right? I mean, that's one of the things that Jason is pushing a lot is, well, let's just, everyone who done a document will tweet it for them, right? Like, how insane is that? And we'll just try it out, and if there's no major lashback, we'll keep it, you know? There's a the whole concept of two days. We're just gonna try it for two days. Six months later, it's still there, right? But, uh, so I wanna, let me add to that really quick. You know, even though we, we were testing, we didn't really charge people, Immediately after, everyone's like, hey, do we get their credit card information? Can we charge them now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, Alan, can you speak really quickly to how our product cycle works? Like, how, we, how quickly, at the size of our company, we move out product and the pace of how we do it? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it really depends on exactly what we're talking about, how big the product or project is. But, you know, at DocStuff, we literally work in one-week sprint. So, we, you know, we meet, on, we meet on Friday, we talk about what was done that week, and we plan for things um, from the roadmap to be accomplished in one week. We really aim to have everything done really, really quickly. Um, of course, you have certain things that are just more meaty. They take a, a lot more time. Um, but we put ourselves in that one-week limitation so that we're always remembering to move and think really, really quickly so that nothing is really set in stone. Some things are, but you want to be really, really dynamic. I think that's really important. Yeah. And so, Zach, um, you had come from us previously from Yahoo. And I remember when you started, one of the things that you said that you liked a lot was that uh, the pace at which the stuff that you were creating, your designs, were actually getting on the site. Can you talk about the difference at working at a startup like ours or any other versus what your experience was at Yahoo and what drew you to the startup you know, experience? Well, one thing is um, in a, you know, Yahoo's an established company. They know what works. They've tested. They have multiple uh, you know, um, verticals on their site. Um, and it's kind of just being consistent, so that's what slowed it down, is when they change something there, they, just, they test it, like, ridiculously. Here, our testing is more, um, of, like, visual, like, you know, get it up, see if it works, change it, you know, ongoing, st stuff like that. I like that it's fast-paced with, like, with doing that, because you really get, to, as a designer, you get to really explore uh, different, different elements, different things that I personally enjoy, or what the company likes. Um, using the website and then seeing what works. You know, and, and with a startup, it's really exciting because it, the impacts are either bad or great. I mean, there's just big percentages there, so it's pretty and, exciting. And talk a little bit about how you like to be managed as a designer and what parameters you want to be given, because a lot of the folks in here I'm imagining are, it, uh, do me a favor, if you're in the process of starting a new internet venture or have done so in the last six months, raise your hand, okay? So we've probably got about 50 people in here. They're in the process of starting a new internet company. And probably the first thing that they're all going to start off with is a designer, right? Okay. To mock up their idea, what's ever in their head. Um, talk a little bit about how you want to be managed, where you think it's helpful, how many parameters you want to be given of what to do and what not to do, and then where you want to just kind of be left alone to be creative. How can these folks find and manage uh, designers to get the best output? So I'm going to start off. One thing, if you're if you're starting out um, fresh from scratch, um, finding a good designer that fits fits your style um, and your your audience. So the designer will ask you the questions you need to, that they need to, you know, target your audience or what kind of what you want your site to be like. Um, a lot of misconceptions are, oh, I'll just get a graphic designer. Well, if you're doing an internet company, 
web, you need a web designer, the differences, the background, the technology, um, working with grids, all that kind of stuff. Like it's, you know, they'll know. And um, when you're looking for someone, you want um, the kind of, kind of like when you're in, uh, in an art gallery and you see a piece of artwork, do you know if it's good, do you like it? You'll know if you like the designer, the design, their style. Um, the other thing is content. When you get a designer and you say, I want to build a website, okay, it's like giving them a blank canvas and saying go. You know, have content, know what you want to say, have a site map, give them ideas, give them as much as you can. Visuals, anything. If you like another site, give them examples. I mean, that's the hardest thing for a designer, even though we can basically try to pull. It's our job is to pull from your head, you know, it's give them as much information yeah, as you can. I can help you here. There's usually there's, uh, the, they're saying, make it more oomph. Make, make it, it like pop. shout, pop, right? I mean, none of the sign language. Right. I don't yeah, know exactly what that means. They make it more like alive. It's a <laughs> website, it, right? I mean, don't make it alive. <laughs> uh, just, uh, so yeah, try to be more specific. And to the other side, <clears throat> don't don't be this, right? Don't like take their hand and actually draw it on Photoshop. Just set them free a little bit. Part of the building it is being creative. So don't be too crazy on. So put the button right here. No, no, two pixels below. Oh, no, two pixels to the right. Right, just. Yeah, and we, we don't do that. I mean, like, I, I think something that's really important, you know, with working with a great designer is give them an opportunity to innovate. A, a really good designer also has, you know, a business, thinks about the business as well. They're not just artists, for, for me at least, in my experience. And I think Zach does a really good job of that. You know, one thing I had to get in the habit of really quickly with working with him is he likes to, you know, I mean, think, think for himself, right? I don't, I don't need to sit and think for him. So, I mean, of course, when you're starting up, you want the design to represent you, but you also want, to hire someone who also who already represents you, so that you can hire them, bring them on, and trust that they're going to build something that is a, a, a correct representation of you and your your, your company. Cool. So, Duty, um, as you mentioned in your intro, you are you are now one of a uh, small group of folks who were with us from the very beginning at our first office um, in Beverly Hills, which sounds a lot more glamorous than it actually was. And you've probably been more than anybody in the company, the jack of all trades, where you've touched a lot of different things. What are things in product and overall in DocSoft that you think that we've done well that as people think about how to start and build a great internet company they should take away? And then really also what are the things that, you know, we've messed up on or done wrong that are kind of the, you know, words of wisdom to pass on to others? Yeah, so I think there's there's one thing which uh, works for both ways, and, and that is, and they mentioned the speed and, and the implementation, the, the speed on which we, in which we get products up live and working, and I think that, one thing is is you know works both ways and what I've seen you know we we went uh, we tried different products different ideas and we tested different things and one thing that uh, sort of characterizes um, the way we think about it is let's come up with an idea build a product and then come up with a vision what this product should be later on um, so the, you know the, the the vision the vision comes after the product which is not typically the way you you build things. Uh, but on the flip side, um, it doesn't. We don't spend as much time thinking and analyzing and you know designing a vision and 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 you know span a month build, like building just a vision and then just you know if it doesn't work, you spent a month. Um, on that, you know, just to add to that, um, if something doesn't work, we just you know throw it away. You know, we spend two months developing something, implementing, and we see you know it doesn't catch, it doesn't work. We did it you know more than two or three or four times, I think, didn't, didn't work, let's you know, move on, let's throw it away. Um, we don't, I think, we don't stay too attached to the products that we develop unless you know, we really like it and, and for some reason it doesn't catch, but we really like it, we think we believe in it, and then we push it and, and you know, take it to the extreme. Cool. Yeah, I would, I would just say that, you said throwing away, yeah, we, we don't throw anything away. Um, Try to get one feature that was developed off the site, right? That's impossible. We just, but yeah, we we just pulled the plug, right? So there's some packages here and there. Things are just some different features that did not blow out, right? We we think that something will actually be something big, and we build something quickly, try it out. If it doesn't really explode, we just leave it alone, right? And just move on to the next thing. And that's um, partially uh, one of the good things we're doing is that we are just experimenting with a lot of things and just. Build it, don't get attached to it, and that's something Jason is really good at, honestly. It's, uh, if it doesn't work, if it, it's, it's not it doesn't work, if it doesn't become huge, if you don't think this will become something really big, just move on. It, it, 
don't be too attached to it and try to like, re oh, I really like this thing, it doesn't matter. Um, the things that I would add to the, what uh, Dudi mentioned about uh, things need to improve is a longer vision, things that we need to really, especially in this size of the company now, we really need to start looking forward and saying, okay, well, how will it be in two years, right? So that's something we're working on now. Yeah. Sir. We date our product, we, we have product <laughs> promiscuity problems. Please. Yes. I'll be your honor. And then, and then just, just one last thing on that. Um, I think one thing, I think it's, it's a good thing we're doing is there's no one source of ideas that, you know, it's not like you know, Jason comes up with ideas and, and then Alon evaluates it and then the, the development team builds it. Everybody, like the, the actual features that's on the side, each feature came from a different person. So everybody suggests features and then we, you know, we, we discuss it and then um, there's a lot of freedom of, you know, everybody sees a different side of the company, different side of the product and, and gets a different inspiration. And that's one of the things that also, one of the reasons why we have so many ideas and, and we have to act fast on them, but that's, that's I think is a, it's a good trait. So I, I think one of the big things, it's consistency in what you're all saying, and I would say as a starting point for how to build a great internet company is, when, when Alon and I started Docstock four years ago, neither of us had ever built a consumer internet application. I mean, you've been working on technology a long time, but I was coming out of business school and law school. I had never done anything on the internet. And Alon, you know, ha had been working in enterprise software. And what I would say is something that we did, which isn't, un which, you know, isn't uncommon to our situation is, when you start out, you really both from a product standpoint and from a business standpoint, want to be able to emulate other people who have had success and copy and iterate very quickly. And the mistake a lot of us make is that we try to figure out things on our own. And we take a very long, circuitous road of saying, hey, I'm going to figure this out. I'm smart enough. And sometimes it's the people that are too smart for their own good that take a long time. Where there are a lot of folks out there that have already had a model for success. And one of the, our mantras early on is, Let's copy and iterate. Let's copy and iterate, both from product, how people got customers, how people got traffic. And we never really tried to invent from scratch a model that worked. What we did instead, rather, is we said, what are other people that are doing that are successful? And how do we copy them as quickly as possible and then iterate and make what we're doing our own? And just, you know, the thing I'd ask you to share is, you know, from four years ago to today, you know, what are the big things that you think that we've done, you know, together as co-founders, but then as an organization, to really kind of break out of the pack and what are the, some of the things that the folks here should take from those lessons? Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think if you, even more of a recent example and sort of like something thinking back four years is um, like emails, let's say. So we're starting now uh, a lot of email marketing, right? So instead of starting from scratch really and saying, how should an email look like, people like? Well, let's look at what people have done. So look at all the examples of emails that are actually working, things that we like and just really just copy them, copy the, the structure. I'm sure they're between Yao and Amazon, whatever, all of these, they, they done so many testing. Why should we start from scratch and really start this whole, what will, what will work for, for docs? Like start from something that works and then improve it. Um, so that's just one example. So let, let's stay on that, because Alan, I'd like you and Duty and Zach also to talk about, share with everyone here kind of our ideation and creation process on the product side, right? So, you know, um, we actually had the order of tonight different. We were going to start off with business development and sales and then go to product and technology. And Tucker, our, our head of uh, business development, said, hey, Jason, start with product. That's where people are here in the room. Then go to development, go to sales. So we made an audible at the last second, which was a great idea. But, you know, as a lot of people here are looking at building out their first version of the products, building their second, talk a little bit about how we actually come up with ideas for products, how we implement them, and then the discipline that we've built where we immediately go to look at what other people are doing and see what elements we want to take from them. What makes money? <laughs> Revenue. So, um, so one of the ways in which we come, we come up with the ideas on what to build, besides you know, just everyone brainstorming and every single day when you go online, you browse their sites and you see what other people are doing, that, that's one. Um, one of the main ways I like to decide which, what our product direction should be is, is, so I mentioned this earlier, is testing. So what I like to do is, I like to, te to test something that proves the theory. So if I can test something out on the site that will say like, for example, you know, um, people are looking for some sort of corporate option, right? But instead of going on the back end and building out this entire corporate option that includes licenses and, you know, some storage space and, and um, a total, a, 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 that pretty much, that pretty much sums it up. But if, <laughs> if, they're going, if they're going after corporate options, we should test it first. Like, let's figure out 
if there's even an audience for it. So a good way that I like to define my product direction is basically ask the user by putting something in their face. Don't literally throw out a questionnaire, which is sometimes good too, but put something in their face and see how they react. If they react to it, then it builds or it lets me know that there's possibly potential in this area for Docs. What do you do early on before you got a lot of users? I mean, what's, what's your methodology and discipline of how you create new product? I need more to that question. So <laughs> if, 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 if you're starting a website from scratch and you don't have a lot of users that you can test with right sure. away, how, how are you making decisions on you know, what kind of products and features you want to build? How are you prioritizing that list? Gotcha. So one good way, so there's no user, there's no Docstock. I'm just thinking about a new product to build. First of all, like you guys have probably heard before, I think of something that I do every single day that really bothers me, and then I think to myself, like, there has to be a fucking better way to do this. And then eventually, I come up with some sort of product. Dollar. First F-bomb of the night, by the way. Um, you got to pay for that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I basically, I, I think about something, really, that, that, that I do every single day, and I, and I think, like, why has no one done this yet? Or I look at something that people were doing already, and maybe there's already a product, and I think to myself, dude, that, there has to be an easier way to do that. That, that can't be the only way to make a deposit, right? So now you, now you can take a picture of your check and deposit it, right? That, there has to be an easier way. So I guess to sum it up, one, I, I, I think to myself, what do I do every day that bothers me, and wh how do I think I can make that better? And what are other people doing that I think I can improve on? So one other question I want to ask you, uh, Ian, where are you? Stand up, Ian. So Ian's a good friend of ours. He's actually subleasing some space from us. He's got an awesome company called ZipRecruiter that lets you very easily post your job recommendations online to every single major job board. And you know, there's no extra cost. It's a monthly subscription service. And you came from rent.com. You came from my life. Where else were you at? Uh, uh, stamps.com. All right, stop bragging, dude. All right, that's enough. <laughs> so, but um, Ian has been someone that we all looked up to for a long time as one of the best heads of product. And Alan, you worked for him for a little while at my life. Talk to us about the things that you thought and the discipline that he brought in that was really good that you've often raved about? Arrogant. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so two, two things, or a few things that, that Ian taught me is, you know, worry about the things that are really going to make a difference. It's really easy to get caught up in, on arguing and discussing all, the, all these little changes that at the end of the day don't make a difference. Um, so that's one of the things. Two is my, my testing principles came from, from Ian, my, my philosophy in, in terms of testing in general. And... Um, and, and three, kind of just get something out there, right? Make it as good as you can. Get it out there. Don't worry about all the details. So, a lot of time, a lot of times, like I said, and even at Docstock, I'm I'm guilty of this myself. I get caught up in discussing, you know, color and copy and how they should move this here. And no, it doesn't feel right. And at the end of the day, just get something in front of your users and see how it's going to perform. If you spend so much time discussing how it's going to be perfect. You're only discussing how it's perfect in your own head. You have no idea how perfect it's going to be to the individual user that's on the other end of the screen. So you, you can talk about it all day. You can, you can try and prove out your theories and voice your opinions. At the end of the day, they don't mean shit. Get it in front of someone who's actually going to use it, and then you'll know how it's going to perform. Yeah. So uh, Duty and Zach, can you, for everyone here, as you're going through, you know, how do I actually build a product? How do I bring it to life? Can you talk a little bit more about our actual ideation process, how we come up with ideas? how we, in the very first thing, you know, bring things to wireframes, bring things to life, and how that will be helpful and applicable to where they're at and starting and iterating on the products. Um, yeah, so usually it starts off with Jason running to our office and saying, hey, 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 I got an idea, I got an idea. let's get it done, I want it in five minutes. And I look at him like, okay, <laughs> no. And Alan's like, yeah, that'll, that'll be next week. <laughs> Oh, so it was just it, it does anyway, um, <laughs> no, it'll start with an idea from Jason or Alan or anyone on our team because we all kind of work really well together. Like anyone comes out, has an idea, you know, we'll bring it up for, to improve our product. But it starts, you know, you got to start somewhere. So we kind of brainstorm, we'll look at examples, do a little research. Um, Alan and I will sit down and come up with uh, what we want to, on the page, content again, that's a big importance. Um, what's, what's, the act, what's the user going to, how is the gonna, user going to interact with the page? You know, you need something simple, quick, um, and then And almost in every out. case, we're looking Don't at another about. website for an example. We almost never yeah. start from a blank slate. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, um, you know, there's, what, 100, you know, I don't even know how many millions of sites there are out there. You know, everything's pretty much been done and tested. You know, go to the experts with that. I mean, even as bad as, you know, I'm a designer, I say that, I'll put my own touch in. You know, I'm not worried about that. But, um... Yeah, we'll get a wireframe, we'll put it up, design it. Um, usually I'll, we'll run back and forth a few iterations till we find something we like. And then 
uh, give it to development and then run with Andy, it. Andy, can you yeah. talk about our ideation process? Yeah, so I think, you know, a couple things that were mentioned which uh, are true and, you know, we do take inspiration from other sites, but there's, there's mainly two things that drive ideas. And, and the first is, um, they mentioned it as, you know, Jason, look, talking to someone or looking at some other side and say, well, you know, let's do the same thing as they're doing. You know, they're making money, it probably works. Um, and the other one is it's pretty much driven from the bottom line. So, you know, uh, the, as the company developed, like originally we started with a free site, was, it was almost like 100% advertising revenue. And, and at that time, you know, the, the question was how can we increase the advertising um, revenue from advertising, how we can optimize advertising, what product can we offer to get more people to, to see ads, to click on ads. And as we, and, and that's what drove our ideas, uh, like idea crea like creation of ideas and, and, and brainstorming sessions. Um, as we progressed, you know, we had a store and then we sold one document, you know, one-off documents and we had a library of documents and reports. And the ideas were how do we create more products for sale? How do we generate more documents for, for sale? How do we increase the, the order size? So we add a card and we add suggestions. And, and now we're talking about subscriptions. So our ideas are like mainly driven by how do we generate more subscription revenue? So that's, I think that's the number one criteria. Like what generates, what gonna move the needle the most for the revenue? And as we move through, through like different revenue models that changed the way we looked at ideas and conceptualized ideas. Then below ideas, then the second and third criteria, which is, you know, how, how difficult it is, you know, how, how likely it is to succeed, and then how long it's gonna take to develop, like sort of what, what is the opportunity cost of, of building that feature. Um, and then the way we like to think about it, there's a, there's a fourth element, which is, you know, how core it is to the business, how similar it is to other things we do, um, how adva what advantage is going to give us to the, in the long term. Um, but first and foremost, you know, how much money revenue it can make and how likely it is to succeed. So I'll just add uh, just comments. First of all, we don't copy everything. You know, <laughs> s sometimes we do come up with some original ideas, so it is important to look at other people, but yeah, we're not completely cheaters. Um, one other thing that we didn't bring up is, uh, is phasing everything, right? So there are a lot of companies that are taking everything. They come up with an idea and they want to build it all. And they spend two, three, four months and just building everything and making sure that every pixel and every button is right. And they're building the whole shebang, right? And if it doesn't work, you just wasted four months, right? Whatever it, it took you. So just, what we do is really phase. And we're just saying, what is the bare minimum, the absolutely piece of shit we can throw out there that really just going to stay alive? People won't, be, won't throw up by looking at it, right? Really, just take it out there and see if it works. And then if it does, great. Now build a real product. Build on top of it. If it's not, yeah, put it aside and that's it. And, and that, that concept is really hard for people to think because they're really falling, falling in love with their idea and what it really needs to do and how it needs to look. And there, everyone is like perfectionist. Not us, of course, but uh, everyone else is perfectionist. And they really want to build that thing they had in their head and they're spending so much time and time flies and you know, before you know it, you know, weeks and months pass by and you didn't release anything and all that is just an idea you have in your head. You don't even know if it works. And if it doesn't work, you just wasted so much time. So phase everything and break it down into the absolutely bare minimum and just argue with technology about you really don't have to do that and you don't have to do that. And I'm just here, so I'm telling you that. Um, just really break everything to the bare minimum. Okay, so we're about to switch out the panels. Before we do, are there one or two questions that you guys have for this group of folks? before we go on to the actual developers themselves. Do you, what, what's your name? Rob. Hey, Rob. Um, when you launch a new feature, uh, do, you, with the, do you launch a, um, also from a series of metrics and analysis to figure out if that feature's working, and if so, what can yeah. be new? Sure. So, the, so the question is, when you launch a new feature, do we launch also <laughs> How do we track it? What are the metrics that we use? Do we build that stuff in-house? Do we get it from outside? What do we do around that? So um, I'll take this one in. Anytime you put anything on your site, or no matter any, any decision you make, or sorry, not any, but most decisions you make should be accompanied by a set of metrics to measure their success or failure. Right? Um, otherwise, you're just shooting blanks. 
So everything that we do on the site has a, a set of metrics that we've, we've said before we launch it, you know, it needs to hit these goals um, in order for us to call it a success. It needs to hit these goals to say there's a glimmer of hope we should continue to iterate on it. And if it hits, if it hits these goals, it means, you know, it just didn't work out. We're going to go in another direction. It'll never be something this big for the business. Um, a lot of the software we use to measure that is, is proprietary. Um, we built most of that stuff in-house. Uh, thanks, guys. They're over there. All the engineering team built that for us. And then, uh, of course, like, you know, you, we have our Google Analytics. And um, in the past, I've used things like Omniture and, and their whole suite of products to, to measure things as well. All right. I think we're going to switch out this panel. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Let's get some music going for the next set of folks that we got coming up here. All right. So next up coming to the stage, we've got our director of engineering, Josh Korb. Come on up. Josh Fury, our front-end developer. Andrew Bellos, our back-end developer. Michelle Wyatt, our back-end developer. And Alex Rev, come on up. You keep the applause going for them. They like it. They like it. And then, uh, Alex, I think we may need to bring up one extra seat over there. Uh, so the question was, uh, what do we do to trademark and patent things? Um, from the peanut gallery, though the person wasn't called on. Most things we don't <laughs> trademark and patent. And most things in that you build in consumer internet, you won't need a trademark or a patent. Um, but if you do, um, we can get around to that later. So uh, once again, uh, let's go through a quick background, who you are, what you do with DocStock, what your area of expertise is, and then we're going to jump into the questions. This by far is the group that it was, I think, had the most amount of certainty. They're like, hey, don't tell us any questions that you're going to ask. We're ready to roll the punches. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And Josh uh, brought up his neck brace because... Um, you hurt me. Yeah, he's just demonstrating <laughs> what happens at DocStock when we don't get product out soon enough. So with further, without any further ado... All right, my name is Joshua Korb. I started in technology about 10 years ago, cutting my teeth with telephony and voice over IP, moved into online universities, eventually landed myself as a senior architect at MySpace, and then a lead engineer at Demand Media down the street, and then DocStoc. Where you are the... Director of Engineering. Come on, be proud <laughs> about it. Yay! Uh, hi, I'm Josh Fury. Um, I'm a web developer here at DocStoc. Um, I started my career at uh, Avanade, uh, where I was doing consulting, and then I was brought into MySpace, and uh, now I'm here at DocStock. And, yeah, and hey, my name's Andrew Bellows. Uh, I started developing when I was around 18 years old. Um, been hopping around startups, uh, mostly. Um, up until uh, DocStock, I was working a lot with uh, enterprise software, and now working at DocStock, one of the software developers here. Hi, I'm Michelle Wyatt. I uh, started at Lockheed Martin uh, and then did a bunch of little startups here and there and uh, started here at DocStock uh, two and a half years ago. So I'm, I'm a back-end developer. I'm Alex Jaredev. I started out developing in 2000 uh, for Vivendi Universal. I then moved on to Sierra Online. And after a faithful motorcycle, Ride with Andrew. I was introduced to DocStock, and I've been here since uh, 2008. Cool. And, and this, by the way, is how they dress every day <laughs> when they come to work. Uh, it's a very uh, elite group of uh, fashion uh, developers. <laughs> All right, so um, let's, let's get a sense of the audience here. So um, if you are currently or have been in a past life a developer or technologist, raise your hand. All right. Good amount. If you are currently looking to find developers to help with your startup project or business, raise your hand. All right. So one of the things we're going to do in a little bit when the, we bring the house lights up, I want to try to help connect this group. One of the most common questions that we've gotten at every single Startups Uncensored since we started this thing two and a half years ago is, hey, I'm looking for a developer. Can you help me find one? So. Let's start off with two questions tied together is, one, what are the best ways to meet your kind in the wild and capture them <laughs> and bring them in and train them and, and feed them? And then secondly, once you've all been caught and uh, domesticated, 
how, how does someone that's a non-engineer, a non-technical person, know when they're dealing with a good developer and what are the qualities that make for good developers for startup internet companies? So you can start, John. All right. So I think the number one thing, especially when I'm looking to recruit developers and meeting developers in the past, is really passion. Like any artist, we're really craftspeople, and there's a lot of passion. And just by asking a developer, like, oh, what do you think of this technology? Or tell me a little bit about this. That's how you can really tell their passion, if they just rant and rant and rant for hours and hours and get into the nitty gritty. That's the best way to find a really good developer. And then, but when the, where, like, where do you all hang out? Like, what do you do? Like, <laughs> where are your clubs? Like, where do you eat? We're at the developer cave most of the time. Um, other than that, there's mostly like uh, technical boards and things like that. Um, technical blogs, 37 Signals, GitHub, uh, Hacker News, Reddit. Those are places you guys probably haven't heard about because that's where tech people go. But if you go there, there's tons of people. People are fairly introverted, so if you sort of attack them and ask them nicely, they'll probably talk to you and give you a little bit of advice at the very least. Josh, what, what Fury, what do you think makes for a, a really good developer, and what are the best ways that you know folks that aren't developers can find and court business relationships with them? Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the big things about being at a startup is you have to be really quick on your feet, um, and you have to be able to see a developer who can actually uh, be comfortable with prototyping and be able to get something out really quickly and also be able to do good engineering after that. And I don't know, most of the time we do friend networks or at bars usually. <laughs> so Andrew, same question for you, but also talk a little bit about, you know, what are the characteristics that you, you know, having worked in different size companies, what are their characteristics that you think make for really good developers at very small startups and early stage companies versus folks. Because one of the challenges in LA is there aren't the same number of startups as there are in the Bay. So a lot of times developers aren't coming from other small startups where they have that background, but they're coming directly out of school. They're coming from large companies or banks. So you know, how can folks really say, find out someone that's going to do well and excel in a startup environment? Uh, well, I think the first thing you want to look for uh, for, some, for a developer uh, in a startup is someone with a lot of flexibility. So someone that could come in, and even though they don't know uh, the product or they don't know the technology that they might be working with, that they can innovate on their feet, uh, be quick about it, and learn, learn very quickly. So and that's actually one of the things that happened in DocStock with me. Like I came in from an enterprise world, uh, dove into uh, like a web development, had to pick it up. Yeah, and how, how was that transition? Because you were working with Elon more in software and, and for enterprise customers. Talk a little bit about what the transition was like and the big things that you learned as you went from being um, an enterprise developer dealing more in software applications to a web developer uh, and, all, and everything that implied. Uh, the, I guess the very first thing is uh, scale. Like uh, enterprise applications are usually writing for even in large corporations, it's 1,000 people, 2,000 people. When you write an application for a website, it's millions and millions of people are visiting your site. So uh, what you want to do is create applications that are flexible and are able to handle the load that you know, the internet provides you. So Michelle, same question for you. you know, what, are, what are the char characteristics that you found uh, to be you know, the consistent habits of very, very talented, successful developers, and what makes them excel in a startup environment? Um, I think the most important thing, which kind of speaks a bit to what Andrew was saying with flexibility, is problem solving. Uh, especially if you're getting products out there really quickly, there are going to be bugs. There's going to be things that go wrong, and you got to be able to find it and fix it quickly without freaking out. Without you got to know how to, you know, how to diagnose the problem, isolate it, and figure out how to fix it. So talk a little bit also about your experience at DocSaw, because uh, you, you immediately before coming to work with us had been at um, Caltech, right? So you were in a... Not immediately, no. <laughs> for a little while before that? But yeah. Um, but what was the experience like of just kind of being thrown into DocSaw and then you know working on all sorts of different web applications? What were some of the big things that you learned in terms of how you excel as a developer and really become one of the best of the best, which I think you have? Well, so I actually, uh, I worked at two other small startups before this one, and the reason I looked at DocStock and loved it was because I knew that I love startups. They're, they give you a chance to grow in a, a different way. You get, because you have to be flexible, you come in, 
you know, I started out doing testing and very little else, and then they had some project that they couldn't devote a senior developer to, so it got thrown my way, and I got to be the one who built it, and you just kind of grow like that. You get to take on more and more responsibility over time, and that's, that's really what my experience was starting out. Same for you, Alex. What are the characteristics that you think make for really good developers? Uh, I think as a developer, you need to get something done. Uh, one of the things that I've met some developers, especially in enterprise world, it are developers that want to get everything perfect. And you ask when you talk to the developer, you ask them, what have you done? Can you show me any work? And if they can't really show you anything that they've done, no matter how bad it is, usually it's because they are perfectionists um, that, that I've met. Uh, they are people that they don't want to show you the work because they don't think it's good enough to be shown to people and it'll be very difficult to get uh, anything done in a startup uh, from those people because it's just gonna take too long for them to accomplish anything. So anybody who can, who brags about their Pac-Man game, who brags about the simplest little website that they've done, those are good developers because they actually got something from start to finish and they're proud to show it to you. So let, let's stay on that topic a little bit, um, Alex, and you talk about it. Uh, one of the things is, can you talk about the process of how you balance you know, the way that you like to work with lots of business demands, right? It's a very common situation. You're at a startup. you got folks that aren't technologists a lot of times coming up with ideas and pushing things like we talked about in the last panel that come from, hey, what's the strategy of the business? What's going to help us make revenue? And certainly at DocStock, there's a constant sense of urgency and demand. So we've got to get stuff out. We've got to move fast. How do you successfully balance the business demands that are placed upon you with what you think are technical best practices for developing for the web? Um, honestly, <clears throat> I usually throw a lot of the best practices out because at the end, uh, just like uh, what you guys spoke before, sometimes you just need to put a page that basically mimics the functionality that you want. So as a developer, um, I come up with whatever the framework that needs to be as quickly as I can because usually when then I come back and I present it to the business team or to Alon, like here's what I built, et cetera, et cetera, uh, usually uh, the requirements will change between the time you started on Monday and Wednesday when you actually showed it. So for me to have spent a week uh, developing using best practices and such would have gone to waste because halfway through, uh, the requirements changed, I need new functionality, I need new features that I didn't account for uh, previously. So for me really, it's just get it out the door, there'll be enough iterations in your product, especially at the very beginning, that you're gonna have enough time to go back, you'll be rewriting it over and over and over usually, a lot of the code. Um, not specific functions and such, but as a piece of software like search and such that uh, you'll have the opportunities then to inject best practices yeah. into it. So, and I mean, how, how has DocStock been relative to other places you've been at as far as like a, a sense of urgency and speed at which you have to work and how have you balanced that and just overall, you know, working with a business team and tech team simultaneously? Uh, it's like a thousand times more urgent. Um, so when I was working at Lockheed, you know, it was years between when I was working on code and when it actually flew the plane, you know, so uh, it was not that urgent. And even other startups, we were not moving nearly as fast as we are here. So it was, it's quite a fast paced environment. And, and a lot a lot of developers will, and, and not to say that going fast is always the right thing. A lot of times it makes sense to, you know, take a step back, think about what we're doing. Um, and certainly as we get bigger and bigger, that's one of our, you know, big opportunities and challenges. Uh, but what advice would you have for developers that haven't worked in that kind of classic startup pace where the expectation is to move very, very quickly and iterate, what are the things that, you know, what are the characteristics that either need to make a developer successful in that environment, or what are the ways they need to adapt to be able to be successful in that environment? Um, I think what Alex was saying is really important. You know, just be, able, be realize that you're gonna put out an unfinished product. It's gonna come out in the simplest form possible just so that you can get it out there. Um, it's, I mean, it's encouraging actually working in a really fast paced environment because you do something on Monday and you see it sometimes released later that day um, or a day or two later. And so there's a lot of feedback really quickly, which is very encouraging as a developer and gives you the passion to keep going. Cool. 
And so, Andrew, can you also talk a little bit, I mean, I think one of the things that might be interesting for the folks here to hear about is um, you were the very first employee of DocStop, and you were with us when it was um, you, me, and Alon, and you were working with us when it was out of my living room, um, and you were this in the very, very early days when we literally would be at the office regularly until about 2 or 3 a.m. Just talk to everyone here about your perspective from being at the company from when it was three people you know, in a little office working, you know, totally insane hours to 30 people where it's just kind of insane hours. <laughs> <laughs> like, what was that experience like for you? Uh, honestly, it was a lot of fun. But then I, you know, I really enjoy it, which is why I actually spent a lot of my uh, time in the startup world. Uh, overall, if you look at it, you can say that it's become more structured, the company, over time. Uh, initially, when we first started working. I mean, that first year, what hours were you kind of, what, what hours were you working? Oh, uh, yeah, we were working seven days a week, like 14 hours a day, if not more. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty crazy hours. But uh, Jason delivered his pizza, so that was good. <laughs> Uh, and, th and then what do you, what have, like, how did you notice like, the change and talk about that process of along the way where you found a change and where different processes and procedures came in from the development side at the different stages? I think when it's three people working uh, on one product, it's a lot uh, easier to not have any structure, uh, not have any procedures in place. And as you get more and more people on board, you, you just need to have it. Otherwise, um, well, it's kind of, it ends up being kind of a mess. Like, uh, People don't really know what they're doing, uh, especially with a large development team. Uh, people are working on the same code, uh, messing other people up. Uh, as far as product team goes, uh, you have, I think the biggest thing actually is the uh, bridge between product and development. And that's uh, what we actually uh, just recently really uh, came to. Initially, uh, business guys would come up to developers and get it done. Jason alone would come up to me, uh, get it done. And the first couple of developers, same thing. Now, as uh, the companies are growing larger and larger, we have a large product team. If every single one of them will come up to every single developer and tell them build this, uh, uh, it's called build this feature right now, the developer would never get anything done. So I think that's that's really one of the things that uh, changed throughout time. Yeah. So for the Josh's plural or Josh I or whatever you guys want to be called. <laughs> Uh, talk a little bit about your experience, because when you being at MySpace and Demand, where how many engineers were there? There were hundreds of engineers, right? Yeah, yeah. probably like six hundred or something. Great. Uh, and you all talk more directly into the microphone because uh, your inside voices are hard to hear. <laughs> so, uh, talk about the difference of working at you know a company our size, where we now have twelve engineers, which you know probably compared to where a lot of you are at, feels like wow, that's a ton of folks. But versus, you know, we're at with hundreds of engineers, and what the advantages are of, you know, our size, but then also what are the challenges and what are some of the things, the natural growing pains that you go through as you get to be a much larger organization that we all need to plan and prepare for. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think one of the nice things is uh, we're really easy to talk to all the product people here. Um, I you know, steal something from like uh, Inatech, but. Uh, I had like four product managers at, at MySpace, so it's much more focused here. Um, but um, what yeah. were the big things that you learned and took from MySpace with that many developers and engineers? Yeah, the biggest thing was actually just being able to dive in and look at other people's uh, stuff, what they've done, and being able to uh, debug and be able to figure out how other people's stuff works. Like that was a, a really big thing there. But uh, here it's. Uh, it, it, those skills have really applied well. And, jo and Corb, what were the biggest differences for you between you know, working at, what were, the, what were some of your big takeaways from MySpace, from Demand Media, from DocSoc that you know, anyone here is looking to work or manage developers should really think about? Yeah, so I was like about the 50th developer at MySpace. So it was still sort of the Wild West when I first started. There was deployments every five minutes, essentially. People were just sitting there checking in code, deploy, deploy, deploy. Um, and over time, we sort of lost a lot of the flexibility. We would, uh, it became every two days we'd do a deployment, every three days. Now only certain teams can deploy on Thursdays and Fridays. And then finally, it was like month-long deployments. And when you're running a business or a startup or even in those phases, you, you can't wait that long to push out features because people like Facebook are going to eat your lunch. Then I went over to demand, sort of medium-sized, sort of startup thing. And they had deployments once a week. 
Um, even then, you started to feel sort of the pressures where businesses and advertising things and things just weren't going out fast enough, and you could start to see the pains. Um, Docstock is sort of the opposite, where I finally you could see like the best of both worlds, where you basically want to deploy when it's necessary, not force the deployment cycle every Friday or anything, because then you're going to have a large build or you know things just aren't going to be stable. You aren't going to be able to test everything. And on top of it, if you deploy when it's necessary, you're able to test everything as it's needed, and you get all your business requirements. You get everything that needs to go out out when it's needed. Cool. And so, Josh, talk us a little bit more about because one of the things that was a huge, um, I'd say, growth in our company was when you came in and you started managing the dev team. I would say, you know, having a you know Alon try to do everything he needed to do as a co-founder and CTO. And then really be, you know, a director of engineering simultaneously as well as a product manager. You know, it's one of the bottlenecks that we all have. And when you came in, it really opened up and freed up the company. And as you know, talk about your experience from being managed as a developer to now managing a team of developers. What do you think are the things that um, lead to a successful management of a de development team? What are the things to be aware of as folks here? You know, try to manage developers, whether they're technical people or not technical people, or hire somebody to do that. What are kind of the keys to success? So one of the things I really hated when I was a developer was being looked at as a resource. I mean, people are not resources. They can't just work eight hours and develop eight hours worth of work, especially development. It's sort of like an art thing. You don't know what's going to go wrong, what's going to go good or bad or whatnot like that. So it's really important to keep that in the back of your head. Another thing is pr there's product and then there's engineering product. And a lot of times they're coupled together and it's hard for people that aren't technical to see that there's two sides of everything. So the best thing, the, the thing I was really trying to do is, you know, treat everyone with respect. Obviously engineers tend to be a very smart group of people and respect them and understand they're not resources and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to do the actual product development. Um, that's basically. And are the, what, are the, what are just some of the other lessons that you've kind of learned over the last year as far as, you know, how you really are successful in a startup? Like, where have your growing pains been that you can kind of share some of the challenges that you've personally gone through in terms of managing a development team that would be helpful for the folks here? It's, it's really managing expectations. I, I think that's really the hardest thing, really translating, you know, <laughs> it's funny, from office space, you say, I'm a people person, I'm the only one who can talk to developers. But that's, that's sort of what my role is. I really talk to developers, you know, translate what they are. And coming from a technical background, it's really important because I really, truly understand their pains. I understand how long things are going to take, or they should take, and keep them honest about it, and really translate to the business side, and really set expectations with the business side. Like, hey, we want to make this go 10 times faster. Well, honestly, that's not going to happen and, and from a very realistic standpoint. And also making business side really more technical. You know, business people aren't, don't really have that same logic, so they do like if else statements. But a lot of times there's a lot more elegance in your solutions, and that's really where engineering steps up and becomes product. So that's, that's really the goal. Yeah. And I would say from my standpoint, that's where I think we've both struggled and found a lot of success is, um, you know, being a non-technical person, you see something done one time at a certain pace, and you're like, oh, it can always be done that way, that quickly. And invariably, I always think that things should be able to be done faster and quicker. And one of the things that I think that, you know, Alon and I had to develop early on, and you've done really well, is that setting the expectations. Like, hey, here's what we're trying to accomplish. Here's how long it'll take. And, and the more clear communication you have between business and tech about what are the expectations on each side, how long things will take, you know, what's the expectation of how perfect it'll be off the bat, that's where really as you start to scale as an organization, it's one of the things that adds a lot of fluidity. Cool. So one of the things I wanted to do real quick, well, uh, all the developers, um, all the folks here that are developers, do me a favor, stand up for a second. Stand up, don't be shy, I know. You're and dance. There. I know, just st stand up, <coughs> folks are developers here. Cool, How, uh, no, stay standing, just, it's, it's okay. <laughs> like, just stay standing a moment. How many of you right now are, are gamefully employed? Okay. And how many of you would be open to any side projects or anything else? Okay? The, stay, stay, stay there standing. Stay there standing, all right? For the folks here that are in the room tonight looking for developers, take a look <laughs> at these folks' faces, take a mental snapshot, go to find them. Just once again, if you are looking to work with or hire a developer, raise your hand. All right? We're going to make some matches tonight, my friends. We're going to make a love connection. I'm telling you, this is going to happen here. All right, this is happening afterwards. Do we have any burning desire questions for our awesome tech panel that was here this evening? 
to go over a couple of things. My friend here in the back, what's your name, sir? Uh, Chris Penny. Chris Penny. Uh, Chris, tell me your question and I'll repeat it over the mic. Oh, I can talk loud. Uh, I want to know from the panel how many recruiting calls you get a week and what's the best way to recruit a developer and what's the worst way? <laughs> I like it. They're not allowed and to Who's talk calling to us. a recruit? You're someone to beat them down. <laughs> so I can answer this. Um, I get about 30 million emails, 40,000 phone calls every five minutes. Um, really, the best thing to do, and the best recruiters I deal with are ones I have a personal relationship and really know me and really are able to get a really great match for me, like DocStoc. I went to one recruiter, she got me the job here, very happy, worked out really well. Is There's... Nitu here? Where's Nitu at? Where are our CyberCoder friends? Where are CyberCoder people at? Stand up CyberCoders. Just for a reference, we've used them to recruit every single person we have on our development team that we use a recruiter for. They're amazing, you should just go talk to them. Um, all right, so. Yeah, so to your point, really develop um, a relationship with the developers. That's really your best bet. And all the developers I know that use recruiters, they have a relationship with them. Cool. Other questions? What else we got here? In the front here, what's your name? Kenyatta. Kenyatta, what's your name? What's your question? Um, so if you, as a startup, if you're one or two people, and do you look for a partner, a technology partner that's a big group, a large group, if you're trying to develop a website, or should you just try and get one person I think that's a great question. So the question was, as a startup, would you look to hire and outsource a company to do the development to start, or would you look to bring on you know, one or two people as a partner or as an employee early on? Fury, Andrew, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Michelle? I actually have a, a, what you should do is you should find one person that's really good technically. You should hire them and hold on to them. And that person is going to get you other talent. So make sure that you get one person, if you're not technical, you don't have anybody in your team that is technical, like that really knows tech, and he will either have connections to other technical people or he will know what to look for in, uh, in developers and how to hire them. So to answer your question, uh, hire one and then have him decide whether to outsource or to hire more uh, people. And many other thoughts? No, I agree completely. I was going to say the same thing. Hire one person, and then maybe he'll want to outsource. But yeah, get at least one good person. All right, let's get one more awesome question in here. You got to ask a question already, checkered shirt guy. All the way in the back. Stand up. What's your name? Costa. Costa. <laughs> All right, so how do we do our software testing at DocStock? Uh, I can answer that. Uh, we basically we, we test our own code and we push out the code quick enough that there aren't a lot of complexity to the changes, so we can very quickly see if there's any kind of issues. Uh, actually, one thing to add to that: when you actually deploy new features, and it's something I've used a ton of times, is turn have some on-off switch on all your features, and if it fails or you have trouble with it, you're able to turn it off and on and actually test it in production fairly quickly. And also, the ability to release to a small portion of users is always useful. Um, let a little bit of traffic, especially if you're worried about stability, uh, let a little bit of traffic see it. And then you can watch your logs and see if there are any errors. Yeah, I, I would add just one more thing. Guys, uh, it's all nice and, and, and pretty cute, but just the <laughs> truth is, release the site, right? <laughs> Let the community be your tester. I mean, that's really what we do a lot. I don't say, I'm not recommending it to everyone. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the best practice. I'm just saying that's what we do a lot. And if it breaks, you'll know very quickly. But yeah, so make sure there's a no-no. But when you, hear you, you, can't, you can't test that much that when you're releasing that fast. If it compiles, release it. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, yeah, there are no best practices. You can find that and other developer humor in fortunecookiesfordevelopers.com. <laughs> All right, panel, thank you very much. Great round of applause. Let's get the music back going for the next set of Doc Stock Stars coming up. All right, now we got the money makers coming up. We got the Doc Stock Business Development and Sales Team. Let's come on up, Tucker Smith, VP of Business Development. Yeah! John Jorgensen, our Business Development Manager. Jeff Conkey, our Ad Manager. And Kave, our content manager. Come on, scoot down. Uh, 
All right, we've got the final Doc Stock panel. We're gonna get, we're gonna drop some knowledge on y'all. We're gonna talk about how to make money, get partnerships, manage people, be super successful, um, and then we're gonna eat and have some sodas and hang out and get to know each other. So uh, let's do a quick background: who you are, what you do at Doc Stock, what you did before. Um, we'll go from there. Sure. So uh, Tucker Smith, I uh, run business development partnerships for Doc Stock. Uh, I think I'm the oldest person in the company. Which is uh, not a good thing, I guess. Uh, I started my career in the business, in the content world. Actually, I was a ma uh, editor of two sports magazines. Started my own company that went to work for eBay, which is really where I kind of cut my teeth in technology. I was there for about five years. Uh, moved south for a company called Spot Runner. Who, if you guys know about that story, very interesting one. Uh, to learn a lot of good things and a lot of bad things about startups. Um, and then uh, took a little bit of time at an agency. Now I'm here at Docstock. I'm John Jorgensen. I'm the business development manager here. And uh, I actually interned at DocSock back when they were in a little shoebox office in Beverly Hills, working on a laptop literally on my lap, I think staring at Jason about this far away. Um, that was interesting. That was a good, good experience. Um, but I'm kind of a jack of all trades. Um, right out of college, I worked at a, a web startup here in Santa Monica called People Jam, uh, where I built an ad network. Then after that, I worked on my own for a little bit, um, doing small business marketing, helping small businesses get online, doing paid search campaigns. Um, did a little bit of consulting for DocSock, and then Jason brought me in uh, full time to do business development. Uh, I'm Jeff Conkey. I'm the advertising manager. So basically, I manage all the ads on the site, uh, getting new partnerships, optimizing data analysis, things like that. Uh, I worked at Google before this for five years in AdSense, and uh, Jason was one of my clients, and then he snatched me up. So. That's what and I'm you doing. may, uh, some of you may actually remember, Jeff, I think it was Startups and Sense number 12 that we did just on AdSense yeah. when you were still at Google, uh, and then about two weeks later, you came to work for us. Yeah. So beware, if you're on a Startups and Sense panel, we're going to invite you to come to DocStock. And then Kaveh? All right, my name is Kaveh Mohamed. I'm the content manager at DocStock. Uh, just like John, I started as an intern, but before that, I was uh, working at Merrill Lynch and investment banking side, and then I worked at a hedge fund at Renewable Energy. So I came from the finance and accounting side. I came on to a startup world. Cool. All right, so I'm going to ask a, a bunch of different questions to each of you because I think it's a, a varied experience. Tucker, one of the questions I've got for you is, you know, what's the experience been like of coming in in a senior role to a startup company where there's not a lot of people there? And we talked about this early on, right? Like, it's a small company. Uh, you know, we all you know need to get stuff done. What's been your experience in trying to bring you know, a, both a can-do attitude of getting stuff done, but also helping us grow from a strategic standpoint and really helping us blow out the big vision for DocStock? Well, it's a good question. So I came from, coming from eBay and also SpotRunner to a large extent, with very slow moving companies, right? So you come into DocStock, and I, probably a lot of you guys with your startups, you're very fast moving, right? Is you gotta get, a, it's really, you gotta get your bearings. Right, because I come in, I'm used to kind of a methodical approach to product planning. Uh, you have to justify ROI, NPVs, X, Y, Z. DocStock is like, hey, we've got an idea, let's do it, right? And it took me two or three months to adjust, if you recall, right? And you were kind of frustrated with me, like, is this the right guy? Like, what the hell's he doing? But once I got my bearings, it actually becomes this huge luxury, right? And you guys are all on this point with your business where you can quickly, quickly iterate. Right? You don't have to wait for anybody. You don't have to wait for a consumer panel. You don't have to wait for an NPV analysis. You can just get stuff up there and go. Right? And that's one thing that has been really been impressed about DocSuck is that it's grown from you know, a couple of people up to 30, 35 people, and it's still maintained that. And I think that's really hard for a lot of companies to do, is that they get more methodical. They start to think too much, and they're not iterating enough. And you know, one thing that I've been trying to push on is I'm trying to figure out how to control that chaos or kind of harness that chaos in a way that moves us down a path that I think is the right place for us to go. But I don't want to lose that. It would be easy for me to come in and say, no, 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 slow down. We've got to look at it this way. We've got to look at it this way before we do anything. And that would crush the spirit of the company. Right? And I think you know, maintaining that is, is a big part of what you need to bring to the table and what I need to help do as well. So we've talked a lot about in this panel of you know, the early power company moving at speed. You know, what do you think are the next challenges for us that our companies here are going to face where you actually do need to slow down, be more thoughtful, be strategic? What are the challenges that, and opportunities that we're facing that you know, a lot of the folks here either are facing their business or probably will pretty soon? I think the biggest thing is getting a real a sense of self. Right, so when you when in startups, and, and this is the case, is still at DocStock, we breathe our own oxygen, and we really like what we build. 
right? It seems to make complete sense to us. But if it doesn't make sense to others outside of the company, when you start to go out, and business development is all about taking your product out and trying to find partnerships, trying to find sales, et cetera. So you gotta tell the story, right? And usually the story is interesting at the beginning, but then when you start to think about execution, it falls apart. So what, what happens is when you're breathing your own oxygen, you don't have a realistic sense of self, right? And I've come in and I've challenged the team a lot about what is it that we're doing, why are we doing it, and who is it for? And a lot of questions that we kind of, I think the company had ideas about, had a real sense of what it is, but it may not be reality. And what we're finding is we go out, and you, know, you talked about what are the things we're doing right, what are the things wrong. We go out and we talk to these large companies about document management, right? Do I mean, documents, are, it's really kind of a boring thing when you think about it, right? It's, a 19, it's like kind of offline, 1970s IBM. You, get a, you print out a document, you sign it, and you submit it, right? It has nothing to do with Web 2.0. But what DocSoc has done is we've harnessed all of that print material into a Web 2.0 vehicle where you can really find what you need to move forward, right? So when we go and we talk to these large companies, and we're talking to all these large companies, we're talking to Google, Yahoo, AOL, et cetera, and they all get it. They're like, yeah, I understand documents, right? But then you think to yourself, well, it's more than just a document, right? What else can that document do for me? They're starting to challenge us and say, you know what that document can do is it can give me an insight into that business. And you're like, oh, that's a really good way to think about it, right? So it kind of allows us to pivot a little bit. Not, it's not a full pivot, but allows us to change courses. As, as, and I think that's a really important thing to be able to do is to recognize that you're probably wrong. You know, the one thing that I know about the DocSec business model is that it's wrong, right? We have to iterate. If you look at yourself in your mirror and think that you've got a 100% bulletproof business model, you're, it's, not an un, it's an unrealistic sense of self. You've got to say to yourself, my business model is wrong. How do I need to fix it? How do I need to move it to the adjustments and the currents of the, of the market? Uh, John, um, you know, you work with Tucker and there are different kind of deals that you work on. You've now been with us full time um, for about a year and you're in the, in the second iteration. Um, and one of the things that you did great early on is like you were just hammering out and closing deals left and right. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, being relatively early on in your career um, and seeing a lot of success in the web space so far? how you've been successful in closing partnerships, reaching out to other companies. What are some of the things that you've learned and that you implement on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that helps us as a company close more partnerships and that folks here can learn from you? Sure, so first is prospecting, right? I mean, you have to know uh, who, who you wanna go out and work with. So you need to find the, the best in those fields and go after those first and fast. I, I don't think that um, if you just take a huge list of a thousand companies, um, and try to go after them all at once, I think, I think you're going to fail. But at the same time, um, you know, one of the big things I've learned is you have to continually keep reaching out. Uh, a lot of, you know, as human beings, we're, we do well with positive feedback, and we do well with rewards. And in the business development business, especially in the beginning, when you're prospecting, when you're going after huge companies, especially if you're a startup um, and you don't have a lot of brand name recognition, and we're a bigger startup, but we still don't have a ton of brand name recognition out there, um, you don't, sometimes you don't hear back. And one of the big things is you just have to keep reaching out, um, keep following up. Um, one of the things I learned with Tucker, uh, that actually Tucker taught me aside from um, hair tips, is... Uh, <laughs> nice, very nice. Is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is be inquisitive, right? So, you know, it's, you have, like, I just started, I have all these great bullet points about DocSoc. I'm so excited to get out there and tell people how great we are, how great the product is. Um, how great the opportunity is, but really, you have to realize that it's a people business, and you're talking to another person, and they have their own intentions, their own priorities, and you really have to be inquisitive. And Jason, you help me out with that too. Is you have to ask them when you get someone on the phone, you know, who are you? What are you working on? What are your priorities? What are you trying to accomplish? And then you kind of work backwards from there, right? And you figure out how what you're doing and what your opportunity is can fit them and fit that mold and fit into that slot. Um, so that would be the number one thing: is just give first. Um, and don't even expect anything back. And if you just keep giving enough, um, eventually it's going to come back your way. Yeah. And so talk about a little bit about, so there's this prospecting process. You know, you reach out to people like, you know, Forbes or Microsoft or um, AOL or uh, Entrepreneur Magazine. And, you know, you break through, you get them on the phone. You're talking to their business development person. You get a warm lead. Now you're on the phone and, you, and you're pitching DocSoc. You're trying to figure out something to do. What are the areas, what are the things you've learned that really help close a deal and make a deal happen? And what are the challenges that you still see that we face and probably other people are facing as well? Sure, so I mean, when it comes down to actually 
closing the deal again one of the big things is just persistence i mean you, you really if, if you're not persistent it's if you're not persistent it's easy um it's easy for things to just fall by the wayside and people people's inboxes i'm sure if it's anything like mine are just you just get bombarded with stuff but, but how persistent are you what does that mean specifically how many times will you email and call somebody before the deal's done you know after you get in contact with them so just keep following up. Always look for something. There's always something that you can reach out to. Um, there's always something you can reach out with. So if you know if you're talking to you know the Wall Street Journal, send them something interesting about business. Learn who they are and learn kind of what they're interested in. And then always just find a way to reach out. And say, hey, I saw this other thing. It might even be completely unrelated, you know, to the deal. But you find a way to stay on their radar and you just find a way to keep providing value. And you have to keep the excitement level up, right? You have to say, hey, we're moving really quick. Um, you know, if something's stagnant. Just say, hey, you know, we're, these partnerships are moving fast. Show examples of already successful partnerships that you have and say, we'd love to get you guys on board. You know, I don't know how long we're going to be able to keep providing this kind of support and putting these types of deals together. Um, so just kind of have that sense of urgency and keep them motivated to want to close the deal. And what are the big challenges you're finding in, you know, the weekly basis of trying to form partnerships with that, you know, may be applicable to what other folks are facing them as well? Sure. So people, I mean, especially if you're dealing with, larger companies they just have so many deals on their plate so you have to find a way to stand out um, and that means something different you know to everybody but really you just have to find a way to be unique to kind of tell people why you know they should focus on you and sometimes you know one of the things that you have to be creative about is it's not always revenue right as, as a startup you can't always promise all this great revenue so you have to come up with other benefits that are going to benefit that partner whether it's you know it'll help provide value to uh, to your audience um, it'll help you, you know, improve in other areas. So try to find out what they're interested in other than revenue and go after those points. Cool. Yeah, and let me let's just add on to that. I think it's really important as you talk to the larger companies is that you have to recognize you need to connect all the dots. They're not going to do it. You're pitching them. You're trying to develop a relationship with them. You've got to, first of all, understand their business. What are their challenges? What are they trying to do? And you've got to get into solutions mode. Right? Business development is not about sales. Right? I'm not selling a widgets or used cars. I'm selling a solution. Right? First of all, I need to understand that I have a solution for this company, or I shouldn't even be calling them. We're a little bit different that way. Jason just gets on the phone, he just hammers away, he tries to find some sort of an opening. Right? And that works sometimes. Right? But I, you know, as, we as we talk to larger <laughs> companies, you're, you're good. So, but you know, as you talk to larger companies, you really need to say to yourself, what is their issue? What are they trying to do? So look at their 10Ks, you know, look at all their press releases, look at their articles. What is their big thing, not only today, but six months, 12 months from now? And come in with a solution, right? You've got to find your internal advocate, and you've got to make that person look really smart because they want to advance in that organization, right? You usually, you've, it's very rare that you get to the CEO and he just parts the, the C and everything comes together, right? You've got to find somebody, usually it's middle management, who you're going to make that person look really smart. You say, you know what, Bob? I know what's going on. I know what your issues are. I have a solution. I can help. Let me show you how I can help. And you make him present that idea, or you get him to present that idea internally, right? Then it's not you're totally out of sales mode. You're in relationship mode. You're making this person look smart with your solution. Because it's like, he can go and say, look, I got it. I got that thing. I know what, I know what we should do. So he's selling on your behalf. So you're out of that mode. You're just in relationship building mode and continue to make him look smart. And it, ma it makes things so much easier. So Jeff, you, you, know, you had been at uh, Google previously to come into DocStock. And when you came in, you were in a bit of a different situation than a lot of folks in that you actually had a big sandbox to play with. We were doing a couple million dollars a year in advertising revenue. And you had the ability to jump in and affect that right away. Talk about the transition from working at Google to a startup. And as folks here may be trying to recruit folks from really big companies to start up, you know, what those you know, early growing pains were like from you, and then the big kind of lessons for success that you took from working at DocSoc over the past year. Sure. Uh, so I think it's a lot of what some of the other people were saying before. The, it's the flexibility and the speed at which we move. Uh, that was something that was really enticing to me because at Google it got kind of stale because as I, when I started there, there were about 3,000 people. When I left, it was like 30,000. So as it got bigger, you had more and more people to report to. If you had any kind of innovative idea, you had to sell it to like 30 people who had no interest in what you were doing and had their own agendas. Uh, and it's really different from that here. So I mean, everybody works together really well. And everybody kind of is, is challenged to come up with ideas on their own, both in what they're doing and in what their other areas of the company. So I mean, I do advertising, but I do a lot of other tests and things on the site just to kind of mix it up here and there. Um, 
So I think that some of the lessons for success are, are kind of staying organized in, in a, an ambiguous environment like this. Um, I got a bit of experience at that at Google too, but it's definitely even more so here. Um, like John was saying, like you know, your inbox is really full with a lot of things. If you don't prioritize those, then things will kind of drop by the wayside. And the one thing I wanted to comment on uh, for finding a developer, if the Docs.guys guys are any indicator, you got to give them free Red Bull, and you can, <laughs> you can meet them that way. So. <laughs> And, and Jeff's probably one of the top AdSense experts in the entire country. Probably knows about it more at this point than literally any other folks. So if you guys are trying to figure out how to start to monetize your site with AdSense and how you build that up, I'd encourage you to go talk to Jeff, and he'd be a fantastic resource to help you out. And you know, just you know, I mean, we we've been able to very meaningfully, you know, at you the company with you at the company, increase our like yield and percent return on AdSense. What were just what was some of the process you went through and and how did you help us make more money? So we're in sort of a, a lucky spot there. We have a, a custom for, form of AdSense, which is only really reserved for the larger partners in the pro, in the program. Um, but what it did is it allowed a lot for a lot of flexibility. Um, also, our content and our site is basically like the perfect design for AdSense, where we have a long tail of really varied content. It's a great fit for AdSense. It's perfect with the con contextual targeting that they do and the just the size of the program. Um, so a lot of the things that I've been doing are just trying out new formats and, and understanding where users are and where they're going and where they're interacting. Um, and also, which are your target users? And it's actually been kind of a challenge in the last, last six months is that we've got our subscription model and we've also got our AdSense model and they kind of clash a lot. Because if I drive a dollar in AdSense, that may take away a dollar of subscription. So, um, that's been a challenge, actually. That's been a, an interesting dynamic that we have at the company. Um, but it's a lot of testing and figuring out. It's, I mean, like Alan was saying before, it's just, you know, it's kind of test, 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 and you see what drives more clicks and what people are, are going to do. And um, there are definitely a lot of different ways to approach that. So. Cool. And so uh, Kaveh is our content manager, and you work and manage now a team of dozens of different writers that create premium content for us for our subscription process, for our subscription product. Um, but I think one thing that'd be interesting too is, can you tell your story of how you actually um, started at Docs and got hired? Because I know a lot of you here are wondering, how do I break into tech? What do I do? And honestly, what Kaveh did, um, the way that Kaveh kind of like earned a spot at Docs, Doc, I think is a great lesson for a lot of us. Okay, so I worked, before I came to Docs, Doc, I was working at a hedge fund in re renewable energy, so I was more into finance. And in 08, in subprime cri uh, crisis, they liquidated the fund, and then I was introduced to Jason through uh, Russell Canyon. And when I first started, I was an intern. It was non-paid internship for about uh, two months. And I just executed. I just did what, whatever needed to be done. It didn't matter what it was. I didn't complain. And I knew, you know, it was an area where I had zero knowledge in. So I would go home, uh, use Wikipedia, just kind of learn and research other companies, and just did whatever needed to be done. So that's pretty much the key point, just do it. <laughs> and so when it, the really interesting Kaveh is, um, you know, we were still a much smaller company even to when we hired you, but there was no position. It wasn't we had like open rec and we hired you. We literally just created a position for Kaveh because he was so valuable. He had done so much to help us as a company. They were like, we have to be able to bring this guy on board. And he's an example of what a lot of folks are at DocSoc is just great at getting stuff done. And I think you put it that way. We can just always rely on you, just like the rest of the team, to when we need to get a result, when we need to get something done, which is the lifeblood of startups, that always happens. So um, we're running a bit over. I want to take one or two questions for this team, and then uh, we'll go into some announcements and we'll break. So over here, what's your name? Right, yeah, the glass. My name's Devin. Hey, Devin, what's your question? Uh, so as far as getting critical mass, I mean, everyone will find their own way. One of the things that we recognized early on is that we were going to get the majority of our traffic from search engines. So the single metric for the, for the first year was the, the only thing that was important to us is number of doc documents in the repository that we got from user-generated content and then, um, and then the traffic that that drove. What I will say to your first part of your question is what do you do when you're small? and you don't have leverage in the business development process. 
And what you shouldn't overlook is the willingness of people to work with other people that they like. And that's a huge leverage point that a lot of us often over times overlook, which is, um, yeah, you may not have a lot of traffic, you may not have a lot of money in the bank, you may not have a lot of revenue, but if you're persistent to John, what John said, and you solve problems as to what Tucker said, and you're just someone that gets stuff, something done as to what Kave said, and you really reach out and you form a personal relationship, people will just work with you because they like you. And that's not a sustainable situation when you're a Fortune 500 company, but when you're starting out and you need to get that first deal because you have that chicken and egg problem, doing things like going to conferences and just going to dinner or drinks with someone from a large company like Living Social, you'd be surprised at how often then they'll say, you know what, this is a cool person, we want to help them out. Because in the internet space, they were where you were just a year or two ago, right? You're not dealing with Fortune 500s like General Electric. They have no expectation of where you're at. These are folks that were fighting and scrapping just like you were a year or two ago. And so really making it about, hey, this is someone I like and believe in, you can leverage that a lot early on. Other questions? Right over here. There wasn't a lot of infrastructure before. You, you, you figured out along the way, our focus was always on providing professional documents. You know, that's now morphed into being the premier resource online for small businesses. And there was no plan for infrastructure. We just kind of figured it out as we went along. Uh, over here, yeah. Uh, uh, early on, What's your name? Travis. Travis. So in, I'll answer this and then we'll uh, start to transition, but um, it really depends on the business that you're building. We built a business that we knew was gonna require scale to get to the goals that we wanted. So because we had an all free site to start off with, we had to be able to reach millions of people to really be able to build a business that then was gonna make tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And so our goal for the first year was scale, 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 and then like a lot of other internet companies do, we went to a freemium model where there's some stuff that's free and there's some stuff that's paid. That's not always the best way to go. And a lot of times if I had to start a new internet company, I would build a product from day one we were charging from like ZipRecruiter. And just to give Ian another plug, ZipRecruiter doesn't need you know 10 million people a month, 25 million people a month like we have to be successful. How many, how many customers do you have now, Ian? Got You've got 1,000. And he's got a business that you now employ how many people? Four people. And so, listen, we certainly couldn't employ four people with a 1,000 visitors. That wouldn't even pay for any of you to walk in the door here this <laughs> evening. But different businesses require different things. And one of the big mantras that we've had at DocStock now that we've been pushing forward for for the last year is the following, which is when you're starting out and you're early on, and as you're growing your companies, the, one of the big challenges is not that there's not opportunity, but that there are so many different opportunities and so many different directions you can go in, and which ones do you pick? And I think if you've taken anything away from us this evening, it's that, hey, we move quickly, we try lots of things, we test things, we try to have a big vision for what we're going towards. And there are four factors that we look at the company when we make any product decision, when we make any development decision, and when we make any business decision. And it's the lens at which we look at every single thing in which we do. And we ask ourselves these four questions, and I would encourage you to really use this as your mantra. And the first question we asked, and Judy was talking about this before, is what's the potential upside of this particular effort? The second is what's its likelihood of success? The third is what's the effort involved? And the fourth is how strategic is this to my business? So once again, what's the potential upside? What's its likelihood of success? What's the effort involved? And what's the strategic value? And what you want to do is as startups, we can't work on things that if you do them, don't have a big upside. We're not going to move our businesses. You've got to do things that if they work, work big. Second is we've got to manage for the likelihood of success of the effort. So the trick is to simultaneously be working on things that can make a big difference, but maybe have a lower likelihood of success 
while we're constantly knocking out those things that make the 5, 10, 15% difference. And that's the challenge, right? How do we do the things that we know are going to work and make a little bit of difference while we work on the big things we don't know if it'll work? And then you need to temper that all by the fact of saying, what's the effort involved here? How much time is it going to take? How much money is it going to take? Because we can work on big things that we're not sure of the likelihood of success, but if there's a lot of effort involved, that's where the risk really comes into play. And then you look at all of it then and say, how strategic is this? If we actually accomplish this effort, how meaningful will it be for our business a year, two years, three years out? And part of our big challenge has been building the discipline to make every single decision we make in the company around that framework. And the more discipline we've got about it and the more we've held to that, the more successful we've been at utilizing the resources we have to get a lot more done than everybody else around us. And so one of the things I can say is to the extent that you use that framework, you'll all be successful. Um, and if I can just you know, take a moment, and I, I said this to the team, um, and we're wrapping up now in just a bit, but um, uh, we, every, Friday we, every Friday we get together as a team, we talk about our successes and what happened um, that week and just do a quick check-in and then you know, hang out together for a little while in, in a non-work atmosphere. And uh, I was telling a story about two weeks ago of how when I was 22 years old, um, I remember, I swear to goodness, I was like watching Ally McBeal. I was like, oh, this is so cool. There's this company of all these young people, and there's this unisex bathroom, and like, they all hang out together and have these wacky adventures. <laughs> and um, I remember very explicitly thinking to myself, that is something I would love to be able to create one day. And I didn't know how. I mean, I was 22. I was just out of college. It's like, it just seemed like a pipe dream. And uh, I remember after, like, we all had this one really hard week working together and hanging out, it just struck me. It's like, this is what we've now created at Dockstock, uh, minus the unisex bathroom, which I would personally be a little freaked out about. <laughs> um, and I can honestly say that the, one of the, you know, the biggest joys in my life is getting to come into work every day with this group of men and women that work their asses off, that are really the best at what they do, that are all just really good people, and... I wish all of you really the same opportunity and excitement to work with a group of people that are as amazing. And I couldn't be more proud and thankful of everybody at DocStock. And if we were able to impart anything upon you tonight that helps you out as you start and grow your companies, uh, it just means a lot to me that we we're able to do it together as a team. So thank you all for coming out. But more importantly, thank you all for everyone at DocStock for tonight and everything that you do. We can get the music turned back up. Uh, Alea, where are you at? Alea's got the tickets. You can come find her if you tweet it out and you want to know if you won the Israel ticket. Everyone, thank you for coming out to Startups Uncensored 21. We look forward to seeing you for Startup Uncensored number 22.